Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Jump On Air. We're so happy you've chosen to spend a little bit of your Friday with us as we explore statistics, science, data, and of course, Jump. My name is Julian Paris. I am the Learning Strategy Manager here at Jump Software. And as always, I get the great privilege to be your host for Jump On Air. And we have a really great program for you today full of speakers who are going to share their stories and share their wisdom with us. I'm going to show this program throughout the day so that you know if you have to leave that we'll be coming back right on time so you can always come back for your favorite segments. The link to remember is jump.com slash jump on air, which will always reconnect you right back to the live stream. And after the show, make sure you visit our segment pages at community.jump.com slash jump on air, where you can get all the data that any of our speakers show, journals, you can interact with our speakers, ask questions, or even watch all your favorite uh, past segments and past episodes right there at community.jump.com slash jump on air. I have a couple of quick announcements for you today before we get started. The first is that next week is a special week in a few ways. Uh, first is that we only have shows on Monday and Friday, but they are special shows. We have a sports analytics episode on Monday, and we have a data analysis in science episode on Friday. So be sure to tune in to those shows because they're going to be really outstanding. The reason we're off on Wednesday is because we have a great stat speaking event coming up. Statistically speaking is our uh, great public event, uh, free to join. We're going to be talking about data visualization for scientists and engineers. Uh, Nick Debras is on and he is going to talk us through dashboards and we have a great panel discussion. So make sure to join us Wednesday, uh, May 13th, 1 to 3, jump.com slash stat speaking to register. One more announcement, discoverysummit.jump is the link to you hit after this show if you're able to submit a abstract for this year's Discovery Summit carry. It's all online, so you can join from anywhere, no travel needed. And the deadline is this afternoon at 5. We don't need much. We just need a short abstract and a title to hold your place. Uh, you'll be submitted, and our panel will review them and uh, get back to you, I believe, sometime later in May. So definitely visit Discovery summit.jump after the show and submit your abstract uh, discovery is a great place to present and this year is an all online experience and show so be sure to join us for that all right so as you all know before we start our main program i always like to do a bit of a segment and today i'm going to do another dinner table stats where i talk about statistical concepts that are meant for sharing and i did this once before uh back way 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 long ago on april 24th which is fun fact a year ago today april 24th and on that episode, I talked about the weak law of large numbers. I actually was showing uh, a comic by Randall Monroe over at XKCD where he was talking about garbage math. Uh, and one of the concepts he was talking about in there is the fact that when you add more observations to a sample, the estimate from that sample, the mean estimate, uh, is less garbage. Rather, it is closer to the population. And I showed that through some simulations in Jump. And Jump makes it really easy to show concepts uh, via simulation. And so what I want to do today is actually talk through via simulation another really important concept, which is errors in statistics. And I thought of this because actually on Wednesday, Randall posted another comment, uh, com comic, uh, where he talked about error types. And I'll just read a few of these. So the type 1 error, as you may all know, is a false positive. A type 2 error is a false negative. And he goes all the way down through some errors you may not have heard of until he gets to a type 9 error, uh, which he claims is the rise of Skywalker. I realize that might be a hot take here, but uh, we're not going to take up Randall's position. You can argue with him if you like. We're going to talk about the first two types of errors, a type 1 and a type 2 error. And I want to talk about it again within Jump using some simulations because I think that makes it easy to share so you can take this to your dinner table as well. So these simulations are all under the help menu. You can always go to the sample data uh, index and scroll down to the examples for teaching and you'll notice, sorry, not examples for teaching, you'll do teaching scripts, excuse me, interactive teaching modules, and there's lots of great demonstrations in here. The one I'm going to be using is the hypothesis testing for the mean script. And so what I'll do is actually close that, and I already have it open here. Now, if you remember from the past episode where I talked about the weak law of large numbers, I was really interested in measuring my internet speed because I was frustrated at AT&T and others for getting fewer megabits per second than I had paid for. So the situation was I was averaging about 500 megabits per second, and I was trying to make some changes to my network to increase that speed to what I thought I should be getting based on what I paid for. So in this simulation, let's imagine I made a change and that change did nothing, that maybe I swapped a cable or I did something to my network. And truly, the Internet speed after that was still 500 megabits per second. 
So this is the situation where we call the null hypothesis being true. And what this simulation lets me do is look at what happens to the tests we run when we're sampling in a world where the null hypothesis is true. You'll see that the null hypothesis is the mean under the null is 500. The true mean of the population is 500. So every time I click draw here, I'm going to get a sample of five internet speeds. That's me going and measuring it. And it's going to plot for me the test statistic. In this case, it's a t-statistic. So those are the five observations I received. That is the test statistic I observed. You can actually expand this to see the p-value if you like, but we don't have to pay attention to that. Just look where the test statistic is. It's close to zero as a t-statistic. It certainly didn't exceed my critical values, the values beyond which I would reject the null. I would presume that there is a real difference in internet speed. So I've made the correct decision here. I have uh, not rejected the null, which is correct in a world where the null is true. I could do this a number of times interactively. You notice the last time I did it, I actually got a sample where I happened to get internet speeds for the five observations in my sample that pushed my value for my test statistic beyond the critical, and I rejected the null. Uh-oh, that's wrong in this world. That's an error. So I just made a false alarm. And of the tests I've run so far, I have made it 33% of the time. That's not going to be true over the long run. In fact, let me do a thousand samples at a time here. And you'll notice that the long run error rate, the error rate I'm tending to get over now thousands of samples, is close to 5%. That's actually what I set my alpha to be as 5% here. And if I do this enough times, it's going to converge to directly 5%. My test is set up to have that error rate. So that's a false alarm. What does a false negative look like, a type 2 error? Let's reset our samples. We have to change the world. The world needs to be now where my internet speed is actually different than 500, but I'm testing my internet speed against the presumption that it hasn't changed. And that's the null hypothesis, what it should be if nothing was having an effect. So now this world has a mean of 510, and I'm testing it against 500. What happens when I draw a sample? Let's do one at a time. The first time, I actually drew a sample, unfortunately, that looked a lot like a sample I would get by chance alone. I've missed that effect. And that's terrible as a scientist, right? You did all this work to do an experiment and you've missed the effect. Let me keep drawing samples and let's see what happens. Well, I got a few samples where I finally rejected the null. Those are correct decisions here. But I've gotten a lot of misses, a lot of type 2 errors. Let's do this over a thousand observations, or sorry, excuse me, a thousand samples at a click. You'll notice that a lot of the time I'm getting samples that look like the types of samples I would get if the null were true. And because of how my test is set up, those are our misses. I have low power in this situation. This test is not very good at detecting a true effect. In fact, I've only done that 21% of the time. That's the percent of the time I've actually rejected the null. So I have a huge type 2 error rate. Now, what's fun about the simulation is I can reset this, and I can imagine a different scenario. What if I don't change anything about the world? The effect on my internet speed is still 10 megabits per second better, but I'm taking samples of 50 tests each time, 50 tests of my internet speed. So I actually have to run that test online over and over and over 50 times. From the weak law of large numbers, we know that doing that test more times is going to help my sample mean be more like the population mean, more like 510. So every time I run my 50 tests, I'm likely to get a sample mean right near 510. And what that means for my hypothesis test is more of my tests will reject the null, or I should say will allow me to say, oh, this mean I observed is really unlikely due to chance, that it's instead due to a real effect. And you'll notice now 99.8% of those hypothesis tests over the thousand I just ran rejected the null. So now my type 2 error rate is a lot lower. So as far as concepts we're sharing, hypothesis testing is a really great one, and doing it via simulation gives you the opportunity to see how things you change actually have effects on different error rates. Now, we didn't talk about one important thing. I presumed a normal distribution that whole time. And we're gonna come back later and talk about what happens when the population isn't normal. And we're gonna do it in the context of, like I said before, one of my favorite concepts in all of statistics, which is the central limit theorem. But we're gonna to have to return to that at a later time. So that was Dinner Table Stats, concepts worth sharing. Now in our first segment, 
I'm really happy to have the academic team on to talk about teaching and learning with Jump at colleges and universities. And it's so appropriate because that teaching script is actually one of the many things that the academic team manages and creates for professors to help teach statistical concepts. So I'm really happy for this featured program, Teaching and Learning with Jump at Colleges and Universities. And um, all right, well, um, hello everyone. I'm Kurt Heinrichs. I'm the uh, academic program manager here at Jump. And today, uh, myself, along with some of my colleagues, will be telling you a little bit about some of the things we're doing to uh, support teaching and learning at universities. Um, next slide, please. So I think it's probably good to start off with just what do we do on the uh, academic team? And I think that's uh, four main things. Uh, first, we license and support faculty, students, and researchers. Uh, we do this uh, by providing what we call the Jump Academic Suite. Uh, this provides unlimited access to these individuals uh, at a given university. Uh, secondly, we focus a lot on four-year universities, both undergraduate and graduate. Um, but we also spend time and support colleges and high schools uh, and with their AP stat programs there. You know, one of the things we've been involved with recently is connecting some of our commercial JUMP users uh, with faculty at universities. Uh, many of our commercial users already have uh, established recruiting programs, but oftentimes that's after the students have already completed their studies. And we've found that some of these commercial users would like to engage with faculty and students uh, prior to that point uh, for internships, for example, or guest speaking opportunities. Uh, we are certainly there to help broker some of those engagements. And if you're interested in participating in that, um, we'll leave our email uh, at the end of this session for you to contact us with. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, finally, as Julian kind of alluded to, we uh, also develop resources to try and help make Jump easy to adopt and learn. You know, students are not just learning Jump, they're also learning concepts as well as application. And um, our resources are really designed to um, help support all of those needs. So we're a small but mighty team um, across the globe, 11 of us, including myself, uh, with five of us here in the States, uh, two in Europe, um, and then uh, we have um, reps across uh, Asia as well. I mentioned the JUMP Academic Suites. Um, we have over 700 universities with these licenses now in place. Uh, and uh, each year we're adding uh, many more. So um, we expect to see this number uh, increase in the future. So uh, this is a graph, you know, every year we uh, send out a survey to ask our customers at those sites, how are you using Jump? Um, what courses do you teach uh, that use Jump? How many students do you teach? Uh, these kinds of questions. And, and this is just a graph, uh, a count of courses that exist out there that are using Jump. Um, a couple things about this graph. One, you can see the red bars indicate these uh, introductory survey types of courses. These are uh, often required uh, for graduation, uh, often terminal courses for students. Um, and you can see that uh, JUMP does very well in those service level courses. Its ease of use uh, is very attractive to those faculty. And you can see in this case, biostatistics, we have nearly 400 courses uh, using JUMP in those courses around the globe. You can also see just the breadth of courses here, um, not only introductory, but a good mix of these sort of intermediate and advanced level courses uh, as well. And I think that's just a testament to JUMP's uh, uh, reach across many departments and at many levels within the curriculum. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleague in Cologne, Germany, uh, Volker Kraft. Uh, to take it from here. Thank you, Kurt. I'm with the Jump Academic team for almost a decade now, and I'm still so excited. Here's why. What I hear from professors all over Europe is that on the one hand, there is no analytical package which is easier to use and more engaging than Jump. On the other hand, Jump has everything 
to learn statistical thinking and real-world problem solving with data. From basic statistics to designed experiments to machine learning or storytelling. If you are in industry, you will know how important these problem-solving skills are. Also at conferences, we heard often that it is more important for students to ask the right question to your data than writing a correct line of code. Integrating a software into a curriculum is always a major task, but our team works hard to support faculty staff as much as we can. Jump deployment is a no-brainer. So Jump Pro typically runs on student computers. You will hear more from Paolo. Of course, students should be aware of some Jump basics, like modeling types of variables, the interactivity of reports, the red triangles, and how to share results. However, most of our resources are designed to teach core concepts and their applications. Our Jump workshops for students always focus on topics like DOE or predictive modeling or text analytics. And we get new users started with Jump on the fly. The same holds for professors. They don't need to teach the software. Many professors also like to flip the classroom, meaning self-paced learning about relevant concepts first after which students will discuss their findings and practice together in class. For both phases, you are all set using our teaching material. Over the last years, more and more self-paced resources from video tutorials to e-courses have been integrated into standard in-class lectures, so-called blended learning sometimes supported by platforms like Blackboard or Moodle, another great way to give students easy access to our various resources. Next slide, please. Okay. All our online content, which was already embraced for lecture enhancement in the past, became the standard way to teach during the corona crisis. During the shutdown of universities around the globe, we help hundreds of professors to jump right into the new world of online teaching and self-paced learning. The feedback regarding our teaching material has always been great, but during the current circumstances, instructors are really grateful to have all these resources available for free. If interested, we also arrange guest lectures by Jump staff or by experts from industry or other universities. In order to provide a kickstart into online teaching for professors, we created this article on the Jump blog. Just search for teaching to find it. It suggests online support on different levels. Starting with a short tutorial, addressing the few jump basics, followed by how-to guides for self-help and real-world problems for practicing. Finally, leading to online courses covering even more comprehensive topics. We expect that many professors who discovered our materials as a helper in need won't relinquish them when we get back to normal hopefully soon. Next to Ruth. Thank you, Volker. So the first few resources that we want to highlight are for professors mostly, or if you are in industry and you're preparing training for folks that you work with, this might be relevant to you as well. But we really want to help professors as they transition to teaching online or when they, we get back to normal and you're teaching in person again. If you've got the goal of a flipped classroom, all of those kinds of scenarios, we want to make sure that we're providing resources that you can just plug in and use directly. We don't want this to be a lot of effort. And so we've got bunches of these things and we also have a couple places to go to help sort of put it all in one one idea for you. 
So a couple of those resources really geared toward faculty are our webinar series. Some of those webinars are good for students as well, but many of them are about how to teach different topics. Also our course material library is sort of the place we bundle all these great materials up and say, Oh, you're teaching a business stats course? Here's what you're going to want for these different topics. Oh, you're teaching biostatistics? Here's what you're going to want, or an intro stats course. So I'll show you these resources all bundled together. And then also Books with Jump is also sort of geared toward uh, professors who might be interested in which books, which textbooks, which supplementary books have examples that are shown in Jump. So on the books page, you'll see a list of textbooks that we're aware of that incorporate JUMP into their textbooks. You'll also see a tab with other types of books, reference and tutorial books, so things, a lot of books from SAS Press that are still super relevant and might have good examples for you to use in your course, but aren't necessarily strictly textbooks with lots of exercises for students at the end and an answer guide. We also have a tab for add-ins. Many of these textbooks will have a JUMP add-in that you can share with your students that has all of the data sets already built in. So the student just opens the add-in within JUMP, they click on the data set, and they have it open in JUMP already to do their homework assignments. So those add-ins can be really helpful if you are teaching with a book that happens to have a JUMP add-in with it. So lots of different textbooks, lots of things linked here. Certainly let us know if you're aware of other great books that incorporate Jump in them. And on this page, you can also find more information about how to become an author or to get review copies of the SAS Press books. Um, so things that are published through our own press, you, we can provide copies for you if you fill out our evaluation copy form. So you'll find all of that on the books website. Our academic webinar library has a link at the top where you can sign up to view upcoming live webinars. We have rotating series throughout the year, typically in the fall and in the spring, but we're introducing new webinars for the summer as well because we know so many folks are um, at home and having a lot of time on their hands to prepare things in this sort of flipped environment. So please join us for any of our live webinars. We also record these and we post them here on our academic webinar library page. And again, these are kind of focused toward the professor, but some of them are really relevant for students as well, and especially this one in the top left corner called Jump Basics for Professors and Students. So that's a nice sort of beginning, um, how to get started with the standard things you're gonna do in an academic course, whether you're a professor or a student. But lots of other topics here as well. If I scroll down the page a little bit, you can see um, some additional uh, topics that we cover. So lots of different topic areas, lots of different course areas. And then finally, all of this information, the, the textbooks, the webinars, and all the resources that my colleague Kevin is going to talk about in a moment are also bundled up for you on these course material library pages. So if you're teaching a course in regression, you can click on our course collection for regression modeling and analysis and find a list uh, grouped by topic of all the different kinds of resources we have available for your course. We also uh, link on these other tabs to some of the e-learning materials that are available through SAS Education. Um, so online courses using JUMP also links to courses that we know of where there are videos online. So if you're doing in a flipped class environment and you need your um, students to be able to go to a, a website and see a, an instructional video on how to do something or to talk about the concept and then another instructional video to talk about how to do it in JUMP, there are so many of these resources available and we've got them all linked on this website. So we hope you'll find this really useful. Certainly be in touch with us about anything we can do to help make this easier for you to access these many, many, many resources. And now I'm going to share with, uh, or ask Kevin to share with us about the details of some of these many resources that, that we provide, including how-to guides, so how do you do it in JUMP, videos that correspond to those how-to guides, so just like a two-minute video of how do I fit a regression in JUMP. Links to the statistics knowledge portal are also in this course material library. All those webinars are linked here, the textbooks, lab activities. The real world exercises or case studies, Kevin will talk about those. We link to the STIPS modules that are relevant for these different courses. And again, the SAS materials for these e-learning courses include PowerPoint slides that you can use in course and instructor notes. So there's a lot of plug and play materials that we're linking to the e-learning courses from SAS and more instructional videos. So we hope you'll find this really helpful. And now I will pass this over to Kevin. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay, so the resources I wanna talk about are those uh, focused on student learning and enrichment. Um, 
you know, Ruth did a great, great job talking about some of the resources faculty will, will use, but, you know, obviously our team wants to be focused on students getting the most out of the software um, and, and um, you know, and the resources that we have. And these complement those well. So the first I'm going to show is the stuff, a little more detail of what's in the learning Sorry to interrupt you, Kevin. You don't seem to be sharing your screen. That was Ruth's screen we were seeing. Okay, hold on. Okay, Julian, is that working? Yep, now we see it. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm going to dig a little bit into our learning resources. And, and one that is very, very popular, and, and, and faculty compliment us on this all the time, is the ability to provide the students with these quick how-to, um, you know, instructional materials so that they can, they can use Jump. And so we have these great videos. They're these short one to two minute how-to videos um, that the students can use to sort of run the routine, understand some of the basic com concepts, and it complements with these one-page guides. So again, these don't go into depth in teaching the statistical concepts and interpretation of data, but they're really a resource that, that faculty can provide students to say, hey, here's how you can quickly uh, run this routine and, and use Jump. And, and we've had faculty tell us that they sometimes provide this to students before um, the week that they're gonna discuss that topic in the, in the, uh, the, the course canvas page or online page um, and, and have the students say, hey, make sure you can run all this in, in Jump and you're familiar with it. And then when we get to class, we're gonna talk about the, the, the concepts. Um, so we've, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from these and we're always um, every year adding them as, as Jump uh, adds uh, new, new platforms. Okay. Now another great resource we have um, is called our case studies. So what the case studies do is they try to bring together the techniques and tools that students are learning into a real world, real world problem. And you see that we have them across different analysis types, so different topics that a course might be covering. Um, we also have them by application um, or sort of um, by, by the types of data that the students are gonna see. So basically what these are is a, a detailed description of a problem. And what we do is we set up the students with this scenario, this real world scenario, and step them through an analysis. It's sort of the first part of the analysis um, so again, it kind of gets everybody up to speed and the, stu and, and the students and, and the professor on the same page with the, these are the concepts that uh, the case study is going to focus on. And then it ends with an exercise set. So we've had um, faculty tell us they do this, uh, everything from sort of a take home project or a team project or a lab activity um, or a homework assignment. Um, and we're always adding new case studies. In fact, we're in the process right now of developing a whole set of new case studies. And so we're always looking to partner with industry um, and professors. So if any of you um, would love to participate and join us in this effort to create a case study, you have a great data set or a great storyline, please get in, in contact uh, with us. We love to do this and you can help contribute to our community and you know, really have an impact on the students uh, that are learning. Now, a common question, you know, people say is, well, I'm teaching statistics. What do we all need? Well, we all need data sets, right? Obviously, we're going to illustrate data sets. We're going to use data sets to analyze. And so we have a large collection of data sets. And these are right with inside of the software Jump. So when you're using Jump, you can pull up these data sets. You don't have to go um, somewhere else to the web page to download them. They're already built into Jump. And as you see, we have a whole range of data sets from uh, different analysis types or different tools that you might be using. Uh, we also have them organized by uh, applications, um, by, by methods. Um, you'll see uh, data sets all the way from really basic for an intro stack course all, all the way to some pretty advanced um, techniques. So please you know, take advantage of, of looking at those and incorporating uh, those in, in your classroom and, and obviously for, uh, for students, uh, students learning. Now, Julian actually uh, opened up today's session with this, if you were um, on right at the beginning of, uh, of the session. So I always like to think, you know, how best do students learn? Uh, and I can think back um, how I learned when, when uh, I was first studying statistics and then of course how uh, that I taught. 
And I always felt that the way um, people learn is you watch how something affects something else. And Julian showed that with one of those tools, the sampling distribution, by changing scenarios and then watching what happens once you do an analysis. And he was sort of simulating that sampling distribution. So these are these interactive hands-on tools that kind of let students sort of play around, you know, turn the knobs, turn the levers to see what happens. Um, so I'm going to just do a quick little uh, video that you're going to see of this one tool we have for demonstrating regression. And when we think of regression, like what is it that we want to teach? You know, we want to teach concepts like influence. We want to teach leverage, confidence intervals, correlation, p-values. And so this tool allows, um, you know, either the faculty to demonstrate in class or to provide these with the students so they can sort of dig into this concept and simulate and play around to really sort of understand what's going on. And, you know, this, this way we really can kind of brings the data, brings the data to life and brings the concept um, to life. And so you, you're sort of seeing right here, um, this tool is sort of simulating data. There it is sort of in, uh, simulating le uh, leverage and influence. Um, and the same kind of concepts that, that Julian was demonstrating, we can do sampling distribution. So again, I've seen faculty use this where they'll, they'll demonstrate this in the classroom. And I've had other faculty say what they love to do is hand this over to the student and sort of go play with this, <laughs> go dig around, simulate, turn knobs and, and watch kind of what happens. And, and this will really drive home uh, learning those, uh, those concepts. We think it's a really great way. And we have, as you uh, see, we have a whole, whole set of them. Um, and lastly, you know, as you, you've worked with Jump, you know this fabulous, phenomenal team of statistical scientists, the academic team. We've got a, decades of experience across different industries, different application areas, and uh, not just in sort of teaching, but, but out there in industry. So we have a lot of knowledge of real world problems. Now, we know it's very challenging for everybody right now, all the faculty with what they have to do, and a lot of things are online. And so we provide guest lectures. Okay, we can do everything from demonstrating the product, teaching concepts. Um, the other thing we like to do is sort of this analytics in action. Um, it's something I like to present to students of sort of what is it like out there? You know, all these tools and techniques you're learning, what is it like when you get out there and work in different applications and what's expected of you? And um, I often, when presenting, I like to start things with, this is what it's taking me a long time to learn that I wish I knew when I was your age. And students really appreciate that because I'm sort of, you know, this is important when you get out there. This is not important when you're out there. Pay attention to this. Don't pay attention to this. And, um, and both students and faculty uh, uh, really, really enjoy that. So please get in contact with us if you want us to, to do one of these guest lectures or analytics in action sessions. Um, and we're, we're happy to do that. Now, of course, when things return back to kind of our normal state, um, we primarily do this uh, on site. And um, so please get in contact with us if you'd like to participate with us in this way. Okay, um, back to uh, Paulo. Thanks, Kevin. So hello everyone, my name is Paolo and I'm in charge of the academic program of Jump in Europe along with my colleague, Walter Kraft. As I am sure you have understood already, JUMP is the ideal tool for teaching and educational use and to uh, fully support faculties, students, and also academic researchers. We developed a special academic license called JUMP Academic Suite, providing access to the latest release of the JUMP products, so JUMP and JUMP Pro, but also JUMP Clinical and JUMP Genomics, and all great academic resources that, that my colleagues showed you some moments ago. So if your university is covered already, um, usually JUMP is available on the university portal, uh, software portal, or upon request on your uh, IT department. If your university is not covered yet, well, just contact us on academic at jump.com and we will explore together licensing options at special academic fees. Let's say that beside the software itself, uh, there are three added value features that universities holding a JUMP academic suite are really, really appreciating, I would say particularly in this moment as this feature ensure continuity of use and a smooth running of their courses and lessons. First one is home use. Basically, faculties and students can install and run JUMP software also on their private Mac and Windows computers. Presentation server is an option allowing to uh, deploy JUMP software on Windows server as well and easily grant access to remote desktops services such as Citrix or terminal servers, etc. 
And last but not least, it's uh, the unique serial number. A Jump Academic Suite license provides basically just one universal uh, activation key for an unlimited number of academic users, including students, across one name department, a lab, or the whole campus. So how can you be involved? Uh, I would suggest let's think about the Jump Academic team as a dynamic platform connecting academia and industry to share best practices and bring out new demands of skills from both sides. So if you are a university faculty and need help with course materials or want to connect maybe with guest speakers from Jump or industry, or if you are in industry and would like to connect with faculties as a guest speaker or to offer possible internships or recruiting, just please out email ourselves on academic agenda. Thank you. Back to you, Julian. Thanks so much, Paolo. Oh, I'm already starting. Next up is our tip of the day. Welcome to Jump On Air's tip of the day. And Mary and I are um, going to be talking about nutritional values of candy, which is great because I found my new favorite candy. M&M Special oh, Dark. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, and it, it it's actually larger than it appears in the camera. So, um, yeah, that is also not my first bag, so the COVID-15 is packing on. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to well, see some data on this. <laughs> well, I got some data on it, so I don't want to burst your bubble, but let's get started. Good. So you can see here I have my graph builder up. And I put calories over here so you could just see dark chocolate. Right yep. there it is. Oh, Hershey's. Not yep. M&M's, but close enough. But, you know, there's a lot of information here with the brand and the name. You can see this down in the bottom. Um, so let's use um, the data filter. Now, the data filter is under the red triangle, and it's called a local data filter because it just works locally on the uh, visualization that you're looking at. So we're looking at the graph builder. It's not going to impact the data table. I just made this a little smaller because I have some fun things to share with you. So I want to look at brand. And I want to do an use or. A lot of people use and, and, but I want, never mind the brand, and see where we can focus down on who might have the lowest calorie or highest calorie. We're going to, I want low fat, high protein. So I'm going to say or. Okay, so it's, it's going to select either the brand or the protein and fat. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as always, investigate what's under the red triangle, right? So I'm going to go under the red triangle. And these are some things I discovered that I liked. So under the display option, we do that list display, but I like check boxes. Oh. And you can see here as you go over these, you get a little um, um, information about what it is. So I'm going to select the check box. And the other thing I discovered, Pete, I don't know if you knew this, but you know how you have all of these brand names? You can yeah, see kind of a mess. <laughs> yeah. And all I want to do is I want to look from the highest, the highest number. So if I go order by count. Oh, that's, that. that's easy. Much better than, uh, yeah, value yeah. ordering for that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So right then and there, I have that. So let's uh, select Hershey and m and Mars. Okay. And, um, that was one of the things that you were interested in. Uh, we, that's what you had, the M&Ms. But, um, but I wanted, of course, and let me get my hand right here. Get there, there we go. And I want low fat, low fat. And I want high protein. You can see down the bottom here, my protein is um, high. Man, maybe we make it a little higher. So now you can see that we have the, uh, the brand of Hershey and M&M's Mars. And then we have the ore, which is low fat, high protein. And if we look here, we have Weeder, um, which is tiger milk. Tiger sport. Well, that would make sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's have some tiger milk. Yeah, um, I don't, 
does that qualify as a candy bar? Yeah. But okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> So we have this favorite because now that I've discovered data filters, sometimes I create a lot of different ones and on, under the favorites, I can save the data filter I've set up. Mary's data filter one. Um, okay. And if you look under here, I have Mary's data filter. So if I do a clear and I come under favorite, I can bring it back and it selects and resets everything. Oh, that so is super a handy. of those. Um, which is which is really neat. So with that, if I have in order for the data filter to be saved that I created my favorite, I do have to save the script to the data table. Okay, and down on the bottom here, I can bring that table up. And let's just go and run this and come over here, and here it is. It just relaunched with the settings I had. So this is really neat because as you get into data, depending if it's a small amount or large amount, depending if it's a lot of categorical data and has levels, um, you could really drill down and create some very interesting um, views, just filtering on different parameters. Yeah, that's, so that's pretty, isn't that cool? really handy. I couldn't do anything about the calories for you, but you know, at least I found that if I drink um, Tiger Milk, Tiger Sport, it works for me. Okay, sounds good, Mary. And this has been your jump on air tip of the day. Thanks so much, Pete and Mary. Uh, just a reminder, if you have tips you would like Pete and Mary to act out, make sure to visit us at community.jump.com slash jump on air and submit them under our show suggestions and maybe they will share your tip or your trick. Speaking of the community, we have manager of customer care, Jeff Perkinson here to speak with some community superstars in our next segment of the Community Spotlight. Thank you so much, Julian. I really appreciate it. I am very excited about this segment. Uh, we have got uh, four of our uh, Jump Super users uh, here with us uh, to uh, talk about how they use the Jump user community, why they use the Jump user community. Um, uh, I, you can see there on the screen, I'm sharing uh, the uh, statistics for each of these four. I've got uh, Jim Nelson, also known as TX Nelson, uh, and Mark Bailey, who is a member of our staff, but also a prolific uh, contributor to the user community. Georgia Morgan uh, uh, from, the, from the West Coast all uh, got up a little bit early for us this morning. We appreciate that. Uh, and of course, Peter Mraz. Uh, the four of them together uh, have authored nearly 2,500 solutions uh, in the discussions board in the community. Um, they've the, uh, all told they've got about eight, uh, near, more than 8,000 kudos. Those are uh, the, the opportunity for, for people to say they've done, a, uh, they've done a great job and that they contributed good material. Um, so I'm excited to have them here uh, to have a, a conversation about the community, uh, about the way that they work in the community, the kinds of things they like to help with, um, and perhaps share some tips and tricks uh, for how uh, you all as Jump users can uh, get more out of the community, but also get more out of Jump. So um, I'd like to say welcome to all four of you. Thank you all very much for, for joining us today. Thanks, welcome. Jeff. So um, I'd like to, to start with, uh, with each of you just for a moment. If you would tell us a little bit about how you initially got introduced to and how you got started with Jump. So um, just based on my screen, Peter, you're in my upper left, so uh, I'll let you. I'll let you kick us off. What did, when did you first get introduced to Jump, and uh, and uh, you know how do you how sure. did you use it initially? We uh, we needed a, a tool for um, graphics and analysis uh, back in in 2007 of all all times, and uh, so we looked at a variety of tools and we picked Jump, and uh, I think it was Jump version seven back then. And the the selling point for me was you know obviously aside from the extensive analysis and graphics it was extensible through the, the JSL language. So if it didn't solve the problem directly, you could just write something on top of it to solve that problem. Terrific. Uh, and what about you, Jim? When did you get first uh, started? Well, my, my main uh, advantage is that I'm old. And uh, <laughs> I go way back. I, I actually first met John uh, Saul back in the uh, early 70s. 
and was lucky enough to uh, follow him when he was developing Jump. So my first uh, uh, access to Jump or my first look at Jump was actually before it was released. Uh, but that went away for a while until it became a commercial product and I was with Motorola. And back in the, uh, shortly in the, in the mid nineties, uh, we started using Jump more and more uh, within Motorola uh, as a desktop, as the primary desktop tool. And in the mid, uh, uh, I guess the 2005 or so, it became the uh, major analysis tool within uh, Motorola uh, uh, until uh, the current day. Terrific. And uh, Georgia, what about you? Um, well, we were looking for a software package uh, on the PC because we were on uh, Vax mainframes and um, we were using SAS and RS1. And uh, we, it was back in 1996, we chose Jump because of the brushing and highlighting. We liked the interface so much, even though it didn't have scripting at that time. We anxiously waited until 2000 when it finally got the scripting. But um, uh, we, the, we were re really into visualization, and that's why we chose Jump. Very good. And finally, Mark, what uh, you, you've taught hundreds of users, thousands of users over, over the years, but uh, how did you first I get have no idea, jump? Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I actually started using Jump when it was version two. We didn't use it a lot then. At that time, I was a scientist at Abbott Laboratories. I worked in R&D, and we were developing new blood tests. Um, so I was a user first, uh, but it really took off when Jump 3 came out. And so I've been using it ever since. Um, that's, that's going back a bit. That is, that is going back a bit, absolutely. Well, each of you has spent uh, tremendous time. I actually uh, know uh, how much time each of you have been logged into the community. Um, and, and Jim, I, you probably don't wanna know uh, that you're um, nearly a year that you've spent uh, over however many years, nearly a year you've spent logged into the community. We're not gonna, I won't give the actual time, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, but uh, together, the, the four of you have contributed, uh, as I said earlier, nearly 2,500 solutions, but um, the, the time to first response, thanks to all of you uh, in the user community, um, is just over uh, a little more than two and a half hours. So that is the time, the average time from the time someone submits a question, the time that there's a response from, from one of you or the many other thousands of members of the community uh, is a little more than two and a half hours. Um, so uh, why is it that you all do what you do? Um, uh, Georgia, you, you, are, you log on at, at uh, uh, many, many hours of the day, uh, sometimes early morning it seems, but uh, why do you, what do you get out of, out of contributing to the community in this way? Um, um, maybe it's just familiar. I, I'm kind of a person that likes puzzles. You know, I, I can't walk past a crossword, past a crossword puzzle or even just a regular puzzle or Sudoku or whatnot. But uh, I also know how important it is for people to uh, kind of get an answer quickly. And um, I, I love those aha moments when people, you can show them something different and it really allows them to go further with their analysis and research. I think that's a that's probably a common trait uh, among uh, all of all of you all, but certainly probably all Jump users is that uh, that problem solving puzzle puzzle solving uh, persona. Um, so, Peter, does that uh, does that resonate with you? Is that is that one it, of the reasons you like to contribute? It's, it's funny that that you say that, um, and I, I want to say I found just about any topic. If I want to learn about it, I, I look for a discussion forum because if you go to the, the website for something, it's going to be glory this and glory that, you know. But if you want to find the real story, go to the discussion forums. So, um, but I, I mean, with the Jump community, I, I stay sharp by, by looking at questions and, and I learn from, from other people because other people have solved problems. And uh, then I, I'd like to give new users the benefit of my experience. And uh, I've solved some, I don't want to say super difficult problems, but just, weird crazy things that uh turns out you know if you can figure that out I'm, I'm happy to share that with other users so i also want to know jim when do you sleep <laughs> you <laughs> seem like you're always on <laughs> uh I, I i sleep uh now and again <laughs> uh, in between rounds of golf is that right jim is that when in, you sleep in, be in, in between rounds of golf and <laughs> some days during golf, if you saw my scores. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I'll, I'll carry on with this, this question. Uh, problem solving is um, a lot of fun to me. Uh, it always has been. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not really a gamer, so I don't use the uh, term puzzles because uh, I want to work with something that I know there's a solution. And so many of these games these days are, are guessing games as to something's behind a tree and you've got to find it, and that kind of stuff. But I, I enjoy something that I know there's going to be solutions to, and I know there's a way of solving them, and I know the rules. And so it, it's, it's fun to deal with that. Uh, I've been a teacher my whole life, uh, basically, uh, in some way or fashion or, or that. And so bringing that to new users and that aha moment that Georgia was talking about is really lots of fun to see people grow and uh, to take your, your boot up that you give them and go way beyond what uh, you provide. Speaking of, speaking of new users, what is, um, what, what's, the, what's the first thing that, that people should, should know about Jump or, or what's the first thing that you introduce about Jump uh, when you're when you're talking about it to a new user, Mark, it's not a spreadsheet. <laughs> what does that? That mean? was my comment. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, so. I'm since I left the uh, research world uh, 22 years ago and came to SAS. Um, I've been a full-time jump instructor the whole time, so I won't claim that I've heard every question. You know, there might be, but I've heard a lot of them, and so many of them with the new users comes from this confusion that they come to jump, they see a grid where they can put in data and, and they're, they usually have a lot of experience with a spreadsheet and they immediately apply that experience and they get frustrated because yes, I can put my data in the grid, but I can't do a lot of things that um, I would uh, with a spreadsheet. So I think getting them over that, I think the data table is a really great vehicle to start with to get them to understand jump is different. We think in terms of variables and observations instead of cells and so forth. And I think, I think once that mindset changes, then it's much easier for them to uh, learn about the other things. Georgia? Well, I usually, that's usually number two for me, but the first one I usually do is I have a demo probably similar to um, just like the exercise we just saw with the M&Ms that um, I usually do something with uh, visualization and graphics and show the brushing and highlighting, which sold us or originally. Uh, so doing subsets, a table subset, and then being able to uh, take a couple of groups or find some values even before we had the data filter, and being able to see those or using the lasso to call up a couple of points and say exclude and seeing the, the effects on the data. So I said, uh, you've got it with anything, you have a learning curve, and I recommend that, hey, here's what you're gonna be, you know, going to be learning. So instead of getting to the task, I usually, give them some incentive first and then, <laughs> then give them the test. What about you, Jim? Um, I'll expand a little bit on what Mark said. Uh, I, I try and, and figure out uh, from the user, are they coming from a, an, I'll use the word Excel world, uh, or if they're coming from uh, a mini tab world or other products that have a workbook or a, data field or data table with them and try to ease them into this paradigm called jump, which is quite different than either of those and ease them into that to show them the or to contrast with what they are. And then end up typically with what Georgia is, is talking about where you're showing them that uh, jump is really an interactive tool and the capability goes so far beyond those other products. Uh, but if you show that too quickly, uh, they'll, they'll get turned off to it. So to me, you have to give them, uh, provide them that, that slow step to go from where they were to where you want them to be. Yep. Uh, Peter, do you have anything to add there? Just, um, I mean, I, I was going to say, I, I also tell them, uh, it's not like Excel, um, of course, where I work, I work with a lot of doctors and PharmDs and nurses, and Excel is king, unfortunately. So a lot of times we'll, uh, we'll display a, a data set in Jump, and I'll explain the, the different zones, the, the, the different panels on the, on the left-hand side. 
but invariably they, they say, can I save it to Excel? And then they, they go play with it in Excel, which is very easy to do. And, and it's a strength of jump and you can read and write just about anything. So. Just, just one add, added value. Um, I, I think most people, even Excel users, once I show them how to do by processing and multiple level by processing, that they're, they're, they're hooked as well. So. Each of you are, uh, are really excellent scripters. Uh, how many of you have a, any kind of background in, um, in, in programming, uh, other than, you know, with some, some college courses or some mm -hmm. professional work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What the psychology is, uh, code? Psych <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> we'll talk about the time that I had to swear off the ologies, and I was really lucky they called it religion at Carolina, so I could take oh, okay. that one. But I, other than that, I had to swear off all of the ologies, but we'll go, we can talk about that another time. What, uh, what, is, what are some of the common mistakes that uh, people make as they start off uh, trying to, do, do, to uh, learn JSL and learn to, to script? Um, it, it is, uh, admittedly a, a, a different kind of programming paradigm than, than others, but what are some of the common mistakes that you see people making either in the forums or in your professional life? I can, I can uh, start. Um, Go ahead, yeah. Peter. the if statement is very tricky. Um, and I've, I've made mistakes where I put a semicolon where there's supposed to be a comma. So if I'm teaching somebody JSL, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time on the if statement because it's so different from other languages. Um, and then the, the other mistake people make is they don't read the manual or the scripting index. Mm. <laughs> that takes time, Peter. <laughs> um, I agree with the scripting index. I think that's the first thing that I'd recommend people to look at and because uh, it's such a rich set of things to, to, um, to find. And um, however, with the if statement, once you show them the multiple options, as opposed to doing a bunch of nested ifs with only if thens, um, most people are kind of hooked on, you know, the ease of using the scripting language. So. I'll, uh, I'll share the, the scripting index here really quickly. Uh, so they're talking about going to the, in the help menu, uh, just go to uh, the scripting index and uh, you'll find a list of all the functions. Um, all of the display boxes and, and all the messages that they can take. Um, Jim, how do you, is this, do you find yourself using the scripting index frequently? Uh, it's constantly up. Uh, you have to, I mean, it's just, it's just a, something that is a, a mainstay with the other windows that are, are there for a jump. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a little more advertisement for the uh, scripting guide. And mm. the reason I push people to the scripting guide is that that's where it shows what structures are available uh, in, in jump. Uh, the, the scripting index doesn't really clarify that this is a list versus this is a matrix, uh, these kinds of things. And that's a concept that's a little bit different for people, uh, particularly if they're coming in from an Excel world or they're coming in from a world that just had um, uh, macro type environment. Uh, so uh, I find that very, very powerful. Uh, just a couple of comments. One on the scripting guide, which uh, a lot of people don't realize is there's more than one example. They really miss that example number one and example number two, because oftentimes there's uh, multiple choices that you can make on the scripting guide. Um, and then I think the, the fact that uh, jump doesn't necessarily isn't a macro recorder is a big step for a lot of people who are learning the script mm -hmm. and um, just have to tell them that they need to um, need, they need to learn how to script those particular statements. So they're pretty good at ca capturing the script and they like how to, you can capture the script from a platform or you do a particular analysis and you have a script and you're ready to go, but they get a little bit frustrated because they know they have to do some data cleaning up a little bit before that. And so that's where you need to, I learned the data tables and like you said, like Jim said, some of the structures of uh, how you deal with the list and in particular, um, that's the big starting point for scripting. So, Mark, um, how important is it uh, as if people um, want to, to automate things in jump, how important is it to understand what jump can do built in and understand sort of the, the base functionality before you even start automating it? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I started scripting in 1998 before Jump 4 was released and introduced JSL to the world. Uh, so I had a bit of a head start. Um, I think that it's really important that people, it, you're, it is a computer language. You are writing a program, you're writing code. But I think a better mental uh, a paradigm is your scripting jump. The more you know a jump can do, um, and the only way to learn it, I think, or the best way to learn, I think, is interactively. Do things. See what's available. Oh, and then you, I think you can leverage that in scripts. The first course that we taught in scripting was because one of our uh, very important customers, a few months after Jump 4 was released, sent something to tech support. They weren't familiar with the scripting language yet, so they sent it over to me. It was a 10-page script. I was really impressed with how much they had written in a short period of time. And it wasn't working. So I figured out what they were doing, and I fixed it, and I sent back a one-line script. <laughs> it was the one-way platform. did everything they wanted. And so I, I think it just showed that they were approaching it the wrong way, as if I have to program Jump to do everything instead of using what jump can do already. And so the more you use jump, the more you realize what's there, the more you can leverage that in your scripts. Absolutely. And while we're on the scripting language, before we move off of that, I do want to put a, a quick plug in for uh, uh, George's uh, is a co-author on one of the, one of the seminal uh, texts on uh, the jump scripting language. And that is the JSL companion, uh, a really excellent, um, uh, collection of applications and, and sort of walks you through very, very easily or very well uh, what you can do with the, with the scripting language. So Georgia and the rest of your co-authors, we, we really appreciate, really appreciate that. Um, so for the, for the, for the final, uh, final little segment here, final question, um, as you each have helped uh, hundreds of users across the jump user community, what are some things that, uh, People who have questions, who have some difficulty, have a problem they would like some help with, what are some things they can do to sort of help you help them? What are some good practices uh, as you think about uh, people asking questions? Um, Peter? Well, um, it's funny. Um, it, it, one of the questions you, you uh, asked you know, us before this session was, what techniques do you use to solve particularly thorny problems? So my answer was, check the community first. <laughs> so do a search, you know, Google it. Um, but um, I guess the, the other thing, if you're using the community, is, is, is ask your question in a clear manner, provide a snapshot of data. Sometimes there's questions and they're so vague in general, you, you know, it's hard to get a handle on it. So it's important to, to have a you know, clear example of, of data along with it. I'm gonna, Georgia, any, or go ahead, oh, or Jim, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, because he brought up bringing, you know, provide a snapshot of data. Uh, and I'm going to object to that slightly in a term for the terminology of that. Provide a sample of data. Hopefully it has been uh, attached to the, uh, I don't know how many times I've spent uh, a long time retyping something into a SAS or a jump data set, data table, because somebody has just done a picture of what their data looks like. And it's even a picture of a jump data table. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we've all done that. Uh, yep. But that, that's one of the things that I, I thought uh, uh, is very ha handy, because they can actually provide what they want it to look like at the end. And that might be a conceptual picture. But if they have some data, provide that in a, if it's an Excel spreadsheet, if it's a, a, a jump data table, provide it in something that is readable. George, what about you? That was exactly mine too, is uh, provide the data sample data set or a representative data set. And um, also I said maybe bullet or highlight the um, steps that you need to take. So someone is saying, here's, here's the task I need to do and maybe put A, B, and C because a general statement or a general, um, you know, you, you know how punctuation can even <laughs> change the meaning of a sentence. So having the bullets of the actual task that you're trying to achieve will make your response time, I think, even faster. Mark, I'll give you the last word on this one. Okay, well, um, I agree with everything that was said. Uh, in addition, 
sometimes people don't know what they should ask. So they, they put something out there, how do I do this? And we're very good at answering that question, but sometimes that's actually not the best answer. If they could describe more what they're trying to do, we might say, well, that's one way to approach it, but there's actually a completely different way that's going to be more informative or easier, whatever. So I think the, I think providing the data, providing some background, as opposed to asking exactly, you know, where do I find the Wilcoxon test or how do I, you know, how do I get a matrix out of here? That may or may not be the right way to go and we can help. Absolutely. I'm going to take one last word for him. Go for, go for it, Jim. Uh, and uh, provide what, uh, what version of jump you are using. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And maybe well, the operating system. There you go. Those are all excellent suggestions uh, from my many years in tech support. I can certainly echo um, what Mark said uh, in terms of uh, – Tell us, give us as much background as you can, because frequently what, you, what you're asking is not really what you want. We have to, to dig in a little bit farther to get to, to sort of what is it you're really trying to do. Um, you may be stuck on a thing that, well, it's because you made a decision earlier that took you down the wrong path. And, exactly. and if you had made a decision just a little bit different earlier, then you'd find a, a some, much simpler solution. Well, uh, to all four of you, I want to thank you all so much for your contributions to the community, for being a part of that uh, and um, I cannot I cannot thank you enough. Um, uh, if you if anybody gets a chance to come to Discovery Summit uh, virtually uh, this year, uh, you will likely uh, get a chance to interact with uh, with each of them. If not, certainly through the community, I encourage people to post questions and uh, get uh, answers or responses from from these four and many many others. So thank you all very much, and I appreciate the time. Thank you, You're Jeff. Take care, Jeff. Right. Take care, everybody. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Jeff, and uh, thank you so much to our community superstars. I know I've been helped, and I know so many of our users have been helped by your work, so thank you so much. Keeping the uh, community focus going, we actually have in our resource spotlight segment next, Michael Crotty, senior Cisco writer, who's going to take us through a special place on the user community, JSL Cookbook. Welcome to today's edition of Resource Spotlight. I'm Michael Crotty, a member of the JUMP documentation team, and I want to tell you about the JSL Cookbook. This is a feature that we added to the community a few years ago, and it's accessible from the top line. There's a link to JSL Cookbook. The cookbook contains code snippets that have been contributed by users of the community. And the idea is that they're like little recipes to perform common tasks for a JSL project. So if you have something that you need to do, you're writing um, a JSL application, and there's something you need to do that you feel like, well, that could be something that people commonly need to do. Let me go look in the JSL cookbook. So as an example, I have a five number summary that someone has sent me. I don't have the raw data, but I want to create a box plot. Now I could work on trying to figure out how to do that, but let me go check and search the JSL cookbook for five number summary. And there is create a box plot from a five number summary. So I'll click on that. And when that comes up, you can see the structure of a JSL cookbook article or recipe is that we state a problem, there's a solution, and then you can also have some discussion. So I'm going to grab this JSL, copy it, and open a new script, paste, and now I need to put in the five number summary that I was given. So I will add those right here to my summary point column, paste, and then run. And there we go. We have a box plot of our summary point. 
So that's just a simple use case of it. Now, another thing that I'd like to point out about the JSL cookbook is that you can add things to it because it's part of the community. There are a couple ways to do this. When you're on the front page of the JSL cookbook, there's a button here, Create JSL Cookbook Article. If we click that, you can see it's like doing a discussion post, only it's going to go into this JSL Cookbook knowledge base. So you select a title. Um, it's already got a bit of a template here um, so that it follows the basic structure and there's formatting um, and then you can save a draft or request a review by um, a few members of the community have um, offered to help review cookbook articles before they go public or you can save and publish a second way that you can create a jsl cookbook article is if you find a discussion um, that say has a solution doesn't have to have a solution but once it once a discussion has if there's been a good discussion on the the community and you think there's there's some jsl in there that would be useful um, i'm not sure that this one has any jsl but you can go to topic options and you can nominate it to the knowledge base which is the jsl cookbook which that means that it's going to basically request that someone work on creating an, a cookbook article based on this discussion. Or you can start an article yourself. And that will take you to um, this. You would select solutions, start article, and then it will be a similar uh, editor and template like um, when you start a new one. So I hope that this introduction to the JSL cookbook will be helpful to you in future scripting projects, and please consider contributing your JSL recipes to the cookbook. Thanks. Outstanding, thank you so much, Michael. And yeah, I hope people on this uh, Zoom meeting or on our Jump On Air will contribute to the JSL cookbook. It really has grown, and uh, it's such a help to those of us who are looking for scripting solutions. In our next segment, we have Jordan Hiller back for another edition of Jump Can Do That. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to another episode of Jump Can Do That. Today we are talking about uh, the Star Jumper and I'm sharing it here on my screen. This is an add-in uh, that lets you explore the night sky in Jump. Really fun. Uh, it was created by Russ Wolfinger, who you might have seen on this program before. He's the director of, of genomics at Jump. And uh, astronomy is kind of a side hobby for him. So like a lot of uh, people here at Jump, we have these little passion projects on the side. And so he developed this tool uh, for looking at the night sky. So uh, just a little bit to orient you about this before we start talking about the uh, 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 details. We're looking, you gotta know about the celestial sphere. That's what we're looking at. So let me show it to you on the, the Wikipedia page. The way we think about astronomy is we pretend that uh, all of the stars and the planets and the moon and the sun, except for Earth, uh, are, are on a sphere uh, around the Earth, okay? And of course the stars are at much different you know, unimaginable distances away from, from jump, not on a sphere. But this is a model, an abstraction that lets us uh, map things properly. And in fact, mapping is a great analogy because, you know, you can provide a latitude and longitude in astronomy t terms. That's right ascension and declination. Uh, that's, that's where the stars would be located if they lived on the celestial sphere. So that's how this thing is working, is we're showing uh, the celestial sphere and how it would appear at a given date uh, and time 
and, and position on the Earth. So uh, let's see. Let's let's dig in a little bit. We, uh, when I when I move with my mouse, it, it looks like I'm turning a ball, and it looks like a, a concave sphere. But that's actually an optical illusion. What we're what we're looking at is the is the interior uh, uh, of the sphere. So you have to think of this as if uh, looking into the screen, you're looking directly up and the edges of the sphere are, uh, are the horizon. And uh, this, if we were to look directly up, it would be the center of the sphere. And so we're, it's like we're looking into a concave hemisphere uh, to see the sky and to see uh, all the celestial objects. So let's talk a little bit just for a second or two about all the controls. Uh, I can zoom in, I can zoom out, I can rotate things around. Um, this is using uh, 3D programming. Uh, the in-jump, it's called a scene box in, in JSL. And uh, the scene box is an interface to the OpenGL library. It's used in many software packages and video games uh, to render 3D graphics. And uh, Craig Hales wrote the original uh, jump implementation, and I think he might have done some work on astronomy early on and uh, uh, Russ picked it up and ran with it to develop this uh, star jumper. In, in Jump itself, you will see OpenGL. Other places you'll see it, it would be a Scatterplot 3D, the Surface Profiler, and the Surface Plot. So if this feels familiar to you, that's probably uh, what you're thinking about. Uh, other things that, that are really cool about this, the sun is being used as a light source. And so uh, uh, in OpenGL, there's this idea of having a light source. So we can see the sky brighten and, and darken, and we can see the phases of the moon. We have an almost full moon right now, but if I change the, uh, uh, change the time, we can see the moon is, uh, uh, you know, the, the phase changes. And the way that's working is with the light source. Uh, really, really cool. So uh, again, a little bit more about the controls. Uh, we can decide what it is that we want to see. Uh, uh, the stars, you can change how many stars are visible. Uh, there's, there's a really large catalog of stars and you can uh, slide, do a slider to see uh, uh, on the brightness to see which stars you want to see. Uh, so the, the sun and the moon and the planets are their own elements here and you can turn them on and off. You can turn on or off the stick figures uh, that, that show us what the constellations are. You can turn on and off the constellation labels and these meridians are uh, uh, astronomical landmarks that, that astronomers use uh, to understand the sky. Here's the, the red line here is the ecliptic, the, the path of the sun, the plane of the sun in the celestial sphere. All right, so uh, let's just look a little bit behind the scenes. I don't wanna show you the uh, the coding for this, but I do want to give you an idea for how this works. Uh, when you run this add-in from the add-ins menu, Star Jumper, it launches this dashboard that you see, but there are also some hidden data tables uh, behind the scenes. So here are the, the primary ones that make things work. We've got a star catalog of 9,000 bright stars in the sky uh, and their uh, uh, coordinates and how to plot them, some information about them. Okay, that's very cool. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, this table is fun. This is the stick figures. Uh, and this is how for each constellation, uh, a path, as if you had a pen, uh, drawing connections uh, from star to star in the, in the constellation, also hidden behind the scenes. Uh, the last one I'll show you is this orbital elements table. This is how uh, we draw the, the sun and the planet and the moon and the planets, uh, how Russ did it anyway, uh, on the celestial sphere. The celestial sphere, all of the stars, you know, they move so slowly relative to everything else that you think of them as fixed and, and they're just the stars are, are on this fixed sphere. But uh, the, the path of the planets and the sun and moon, of course, change at a much more rapid rate. And so those have to be uh, manipulated separately separately. So that's how the data is managed. Uh, let's just have a little bit of fun. When you, uh, when you launch 
this, when you launch it, uh, the latitude and longitude is set for carry North Carolina latitude uh, 36, longitude negative 79. That's uh, North Carolina where, where Jump is headquartered. Uh, let's look at a couple of fun astronomical phenomena and events. So I'm going to drag this uh, longitude slider. And yeah, you can see day turning, uh, day and night turning back and forth. But uh, if you watch carefully, uh, you probably see that there's one star. All the stars are moving except for one, which is barely moving. And you probably guessed that is uh, the North Star. That's Polaris. Here it is. And uh, let's just turn on the constellation. Well, the constellations are on. Let's turn on the stick figure so that you can see. Yeah, Polaris is at the, uh, the tail of Ursa Minor. And uh, I was always taught uh, as a youngster that the way to find uh, Polaris is uh, to look at the, at the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, and find these two stars at the, at the cup, and then you can uh, draw a line that extends to find the North Star. So yeah, the reason we use it as the North Star, the reason it's, it's handy uh, is no matter where you are on the globe, Polaris is always, if you head towards Polaris, you are, you are heading north. So if you can find Polaris, you can find where north is. All right, so let's, uh, let's look for one or two more events. Let's make it nighttime. And uh, I wanted to show you something that happened this year on February 18th. And let me change the time to, I think 5 a.m. or so is, is when it's good to see this. Yeah, okay, so I don't know why the, uh, uh, the, the light, okay. So, so um, I'm changing the day right now, and uh, uh, you can see uh, a bunch of the planets are, are lined up along the ecliptic. The ecliptic you can think of as sort of the plane along which most of the planets uh, orbit the sun in the solar system. So it, it, they're not perfectly lined up, but many of the planets are, are pretty closely lined up to the ecliptic. And that's why we see that all the planets in a line here. Uh, so on February 18th, uh, there, there was an event. It was an occultation. That happens when uh, one body passes behind in another. Uh, this was an occultation of Mars. There's Mars. Uh, by the by the crescent moon so uh, going to February 18th yeah you can see that that uh, uh, Mars goes behind the crescent moon there so you know it's more dramatic in the night sky because you know you only see the crescent moon and then you're watching Mars and then all of a sudden it, it just looks like it disappears into uh, a black hole in the sky well it's not a black hole in the sky it's behind the darkened part of the moon uh, so that's pretty cool there too uh, maybe a last thing I'll show you, something coming up later this year, is a rare conjunction. A conjunction is when uh, two bodies are, are close together. And on December 21st, we're going to have a conjunction of, of Jupiter and Saturn. Pretty rare. And let's see if we can, if we can see it. Um, let's see. How am I going to find that? Let's turn, let's turn off all the... Uh, uh, all this distracting stuff, the constellations, the meridians, and just concentrate uh, on the planets themselves. I'll change the time until we can see Jupiter and uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, that's Neptune, that's Mars, that's Uranus. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Yeah, that's that's Saturn. And the reason we can't see Jupiter is because it's right behind it here. let's let's change the date back from December twentieth. We'll change it a little bit, and then you can see. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn start to resolve. In the actual night sky, it's not going to be this dramatic. They'll only appear close to each other. It's just the resolution of the screen that makes them look like they're on top of each other. But they will be very, very close, and it's a rare celestial event. So look for that on uh, December 21st. All right, that's all my time. Uh, I would love to hear from you if you have any uh, examples of you know, interesting off-label uses of jump for us to show in an upcoming episode. Uh, we'll post a link to this star jumper where you can download it from the community uh, uh, on the episode page. So that's it for me. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Jump On Air. 
uh, uh, jump can do that. Back to you, Julian. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Jordan. That was, uh, that was such fun. So we have that, uh, Russ to thank for that, I guess. In our next segment, we have Caleb King, research statistician tester here, to take us through today's jump in action where he jumps into the road trip of a lifetime. All right. Thanks, Julian. Let me get my screen up here. All right. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, well, thanks, Julian, again, uh, for allowing me to speak on this. I guess it's an interesting topic, given that most of us are still under stay-at-home orders, but I guess you could think of it as a plan for how to get out of the house once this is all done, <laughs> if you're up for long road trips. So um, I'll give a little bit of background into where this idea came from. Why, why use Jump to build a road trip isn't Jump data analysis. What's, what's, what, what are we doing? So... Um, it all kind of started, I think, back uh, shortly after I finished grad school at Virginia Tech here in Blacksburg. My first job was at Sandia Labs out in Albuquerque. And so, of course, we had to get a long trip out there. Don't worry, we didn't take it all in one day. We split it over a week. So we had ourselves a nice road trip out there, and that kind of gave me the road trip bug. It also happened that most of that trip was on I-40. And those of us who live here in the Raleigh area, you might not realize that this interstate that you might take back and forth to work. If you go, kept going one direction, you'd end up all the way out in California. Well, we almost did. We kind of stopped in Albuquerque, but um, that got that gave me the travel bug and gave me this idea of, I guess it's my inner completionist wanting to finish out the road. Um, what if I finished out traveling all of I-40? And what if I extended this to all the other high and the interstates? You know, what if I could, in theory, create a road trip that traversed every interstate. And so um, I kind of started doing some research. It sounded like something somewhere I might have already done. Um, and as I did this research, I came to a quick conclusion. Apparently, interstates uh, weren't very popular amongst these travel uh, bloggers, I guess. Um, they, the, the interstates tend to be very you know, commerce driven, very busy, traffic. Um, you could have something that turn into toll roads. So they, they preferred the US highways and you might be saying, what's, what's the difference? Well, one, there's, there's a symbolic difference. So usually highways are designated by a white shield symbol, interstates with the blue, but you know, that's, that's surface level. Um, usually the highways tend to traverse through more rural areas. Um, they go through some smaller towns and they tend to be a little more scenic than perhaps an interstate might be. At least that was the opinion of these bloggers. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll check this out. I might try uh, doing the highways. Um, for those of us here, again, local to Raleigh, we have two. We have Highway 64 and Highway 1 that kind of pass through near us, um, just as a, another reference there. And this, as you can see, would be a very daunting task. So this is a map of the US highway system. It looks pretty messy. Uh, so given this, I, I decided, okay, I need to kind of have a plan of how I'm going to do this. And so as I sat down, I thought about it and I said, okay, here are the constraints I want for my road trip plan. First, I want it to only traverse every active major U.S. highway as much as possible. And what do I mean by active major U.S. highway? So you saw a lot of roads there on the map. Not all of them are what we call primary highways. Those highways that have a designation of up to two digits, so Highway 1, Highway 64 here in Raleigh, those are what we call sort of primary highways. Um, if it had three digits, it's sort of an offshoot of this highway. It's more for, okay, we need to reach a little more rural areas. Um, so this kind of helped narrow it down to, I just want to travel the primary highways. 101 is the only exception. It's over there on the far west coast. And I also wanted it to be an active highway. So a lot of the highways, so you might think there's 101, primary ones, there's actually 88. Um, a lot of the highways have been decommissioned. Um, they might no longer exist. Um, some of them have just been turned into interstates. So Route 66 is an example. It used to be a very active highway. Um, it no longer is. There's a lot of American history tied to it. So sorry if you're a fan of that. I unfortunately didn't include it here, but it's its own road trip. And there's been a lot of plans about that. I also wanted to visit each highway only once. The thought kind of being, you get on a highway, you'll travel it, and if the idea is, okay, I'll travel it for a little bit, get off on something, and then come back to it, you might miss out on something. So I wanted to, tra to travel as much of the highway as I could. 
So visited only once and ideally transition from one highway straight to another. They, they intersect in a lot of places. So as best as possible, just have them connect um, one to another. So at that point, once I kind of had a plan in place, it was time to collect the data. Now at this point, you're probably expecting me to talk about how I coded up some fancy JSL to do some geocoding, have a Google API, collect all that data. I wish I could say that, but this is in reality what I kind of did. It was still early in my time at Jump. I wasn't very strong in my JSL coding, so I basically looked it up and geocoded manually. Um, I did do, use some Jump data table tricks because um, highways, of course, if they intersect in one spot, if you flip the numbers, that's the same intersection. There are cases where they might have intersected in more than one place, so there is a bit of directional bias, um, north to south, east to west, as I was collecting this data. Uh, but yes, so sorry if you were expecting anything fancy. <laughs> um, once I got that, the, the next step was, okay, now how do we find the path? And this is where I turned to graph theory. And there's a particular person I want to introduce you to. He's a very famous individual. William Rowan Hamilton. Okay, so maybe he's not as famous, you might not know about him, but in the mathematical community, we, we kind of know him, and he, he was a guy I wanted to look to. At some point, I guess he was bored. He was wondering, he must have had a, a big polyhedron, I think it's a do do dodecahedron, so that's 12 sides. Um, he was looking at it and thought, well, I wonder if there's a path that connects every edge on this dodecahedron, and it kind of it wasn't a globe, but it looked like it. So he nicknamed it, you know, hey, I'll do a world tour. Think of it as all these popular places. Is there a path that connects them all? And since then, it's been called Hamiltonian path. That's specifically if you have a graph with a bunch of edges and vertices, so nodes and connections, it's a path that will touch every node exactly once. And if it loops on itself, then it's called a Hamiltonian circle. So you could have that. Here, I just wanted a path. They didn't have to start and end at the same spot. Now, you might have actually heard of this in a different context, if you've heard of what's called the traveling salesman problem. It's a variant of a Hamiltonian path. It's a specific path, one that reaches all the points, but does so by minimizing some total uh, metric, either usually time or distance. So the context is that you have a salesman, he needs to visit all of his clients, so he wants to visit them once and do so in the minimal amount of time. Now, quickly we'll through some examples of that just to give you a feel of what we might be looking for. So here's some stuff I've been playing around with at least recently. Here is an optimal path that maps all of the North Carolina state parks. So this path will take you to visit all the state parks with the minimal distance. So maybe something you might want to try once we our, our lockdown comes up. I believe state parks are part of the first phase. Um, or, you know, you could stick with the state parks or go big. You know, how about the national parks? So here's an optimal tour that visits all of the national parks and does so by minimizing the total distance. So those are a couple examples of traveling sales problems that you might be familiar with. Um, in my case though, it wasn't quite the same and there were two main reasons why. One, in the traveling salesman problem, you're trying to find an optimal path. In my case, I just wanna know, is there a path in general? It might not minimize the total distance, it might be a fluke that I kind of get out of my path, but I just wanna know if there was one. And furthermore, you kind of got to think about it a little differently. So if I were to plot a map of all the intersections or think of that earlier map with the highways, you might think, okay, the roads are connecting all the intersections. So the intersections are the points and I just need to optimize a path between them. That's not really the case. In this case, the roads themselves are actually the vertices, the, the nodes and the intersections represent the edges between them. So you kind of have to flip your understanding of it. And so that required a bit of a different approach to it. So once I had that all down, it was time to code up the algorithm. And I started first by creating what's called an associative array in JS in, in the jump scripting language. And from that array, that's a good way to code up a network. And I'll quickly show you real quick. Here's a link to a page that talks about in jump about associative arrays and how they relate to graph theory. And also down here, you'll find an example of the code that uses what's called a depth first search function. Switch back to my slides here. And that's exactly what I used as sort of a first pass attempt. So what is this, you know, this abstract depth first search? Well, think of this as sort of my network. And let's say I'm gonna start with Highway 1. I'll start up in Fort Kent, Maine. That's where it starts up in the north. And the idea of the depth first search is just 
visit once you reach connection. Okay, that's where that's the next one I'll take. And then I'll keep going. So in the code, in, in the computer, US first connection is US1, but we already visited that. I don't want to turn right around. So we'll skip over that and say, what's the next one? Oh, US3. Okay, so I'll keep going down until it hits that one. And you keep going and you try and go as far down into this case, this sort of tree, as you can. Now, what's obviously going to happen is you might miss some highways in this. You might miss some nodes as you go through, which is why I only consider it as a first pass attempt. So then the next question was, okay, how do I insert the remaining highways? Well, I could make the algorithm force connection, basically take the path that it currently has and take one of the missing nodes and say, is there a place in that highway that I can stick it in? And it has to be a valid connection. That highway has to connect to the two on either side of it. Um, so you could do it that way, but that's only if the, the path allows it. So you might be able to insert some highways, but it might not catch them all, in which case the path would have to rearrange itself. So one way I could do that was, okay, once I get as many as I can in there, I'll repeat the first pass pro process with all those highways and see if it rearranges. Of course, I could also just do it myself, um, in which case I could just look at the path, maybe plot it out and say, you know, here's where I could insert this highway. I might need to rearrange the path a bit. Or I could just do a mixture of the two, which is generally what I did. So let me give you an example of what my first attempt kind of looked like. There it is in all its glory, and I know what you're probably thinking. <laughs> What the heck is this? This is a mess. This is what, what's going on. What's all this jumbly gobbledygook here? And quick aside, it is going to be a little more dense here in the east just because that's where most of the population of the U.S. is. So there's a lot more highways there. It spreads out as you get west. Um, and I wanted this to be an all-American trip, but there's a problem. We're missing two states. Poor Arizona and California got left out. What did the algorithm have against those states? Well, if we plot the intersection map, as maybe I should have done at the beginning, <laughs> we'll kind of see why. Um, first, we'll notice that California here has only startings and endings of highways. It only has beginnings and endings. Take what philosophical meaning you want from that. But um, So that's something that would need to be handled. And then here in Arizona, it only had two intersections. So what was probably happening is as I was creating the path, it happened to get left out. So there were two ways that I could handle this in the algorithm. One was I could add a constraint that would force a connection. So I believe here in Globe, Arizona, there's an intersection between US 60 and US 70. And so I could say, if I want Arizona to be in there, well, once the algorithm hits US 60, I will tell it your connection will now be US 70. You have no choice. And then it will take that connection and then go from there. So that will ensure Arizona. For California, the best I could do is okay, I'll give a highway that starts in California or ends in California. Um, and there were a couple of places where there were only starts at endings, but I decided to start off in California. And when I did that, this is the resulting map. So now at least every state is visited, but there's still some issues with it. Um, one, there's this weird loop here in Wyoming. where You kind of go up, loop around and come back down the same road. And I didn't find that appealing because I wanted you to experience a unique portion of the highway. There are a couple areas where highways overlapped. I wanted to separate those out, make them distinct from one another. And there's still kind of a mess over here in the east. So there was at least one more attempt using this type of approach. And it, yeah, it still needs a bit of work. So to kind of finish up and wrap up here, ultimately what I ended up doing is I ran the algorithm and then I kind of made some manual adjustments on my own. Some of these were to make sure, again, it visited every state, and some were to create what I'd call more of a scenic route to it to make things look cleaner. And once I did all that, I ended up with this final result. It's a little bit cleaner, so you can definitely see more of the path to it. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of liked it, and so I stuck with it. This was my final road trip. Some quick metrics. The tra travel time here, that's in hours. So it's been a lot of time on the road. And the distance, so that's in miles. So that's over 34,000. To give you a sense of scale, that'd be like driving on the equator one and a half times around the Earth. So it's pretty daunting. <laughs> but so in my case, it was an ultimate road trip, if you will. And that's about all I have for right now. So at this point, um, I'll kind of let you look at this and let's see if we have any questions or time for questions. 
think we're just out of time, Caleb, but okay. I will invite all of our uh, viewers to hit your page on the community and your blog Absolutely. because uh, you went into even more detail on this. And yeah, outstanding. Excellent. Well, great. Thank you so much, Caleb. Uh, yep. In our next segment, we have Brady Brady back in addition of Ask the Data Doctor to take us through Text to Columns Part 2. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the show today. And uh, let me just get this little widget out of the way. I can never put it in the right spot that I don't click on it during the talk, but we'll try. All right, let's uh, talk about what we're gonna do today. Really, there was uh, one section of the text of columns that we didn't talk about much, and um, or the, the columns menu, if you will. And that was, what do we do? You know, what is the meaning of these checkboxes we saw for indicator columns, for multiple response? We're gonna talk about those two types today. And, um, you know, as you look through the list, we're, we're first going to talk about why you might use them. Why, why would I use multiple response? Uh, some people may not even know that that data type exists in Jump. And then other people might want to know, well, what, what, what good can indicators be for me? You know, I'm used to using multiple response. Why would I want to use indicators? Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how we can convert from one form to the next. And we can... Um, also look at making some adjustments here that allow us to extend the idea of an indicator column, which is typically a zero or one, uh, into something that accommodates counts, if we're interested in that, and to do something called hierarchical binning, which we'll talk about when the time comes up. So first of all, let's just quick overview of multiple response data type and jump. This is for more than surveys. I mean, people who administer surveys and analyze those would certainly be familiar with these, this data type, but uh, some things to know in Jump is that first of all, when you set up a multiple response data type, that is consumed differently than say a nominal data type by certain platforms in Jump, notably the categorical platform, the distribution platform. Uh, I think there's some others that do this too, like Text Explorer maybe, I'm not sure on that. Um, so that's, that's one thing, uh, data filters, give you way more options and we'll take a look at that. Uh, I really love what data filters do, whether they're global or local with the multiple response data types. And um, depending on the data, this could save a lot of space putting data in this way versus a stacked format because you may have a lot of redundant information that needs to be stored simply because of this multiple response. You know, maybe now people have three rows of data for every observation when you could get that down to one row of data. And, and then, you know, those, those extra two rows, they're just copying all of the other columns values. So other, I mean, you could, there's other ways to handle that. I mean, you could do a virtual join, but uh, if you want it all in one table, you know, the multiple response could be the way to go. And multiple response data type, it's kind of a natural inverse to the idea of ind indicator columns. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. Now, again, this isn't just for surveys. Uh, basically, anytime you can have more than one of something associated with a record, you could use multiple response. You might have more than one technicians that work a warranty claim. You, you may have multiple reasons that a product was returned or multiple types of defects or failure modes on a semiconductor wafer. Um, you know, or multiple options when someone's making an order, placing an order, they have multiple options that they, they wish to exercise on that order. And th these are all examples, and there are many others, of when you might have multiple response data and when you could use multiple response data type. Now, on the other hand, indicator columns, there's a lot of nice things about them. Also, depending on the context, they can save a lot of space because indicator columns just contains ones and zeros. You know, the column name contains the attribute, and then I just have a one or zero flagging whether or not that attribute uh, exists for that given record. People are familiar with these maybe from learning modeling in, um, in school. Oh, when we did modeling, when we did linear models, we used indicator columns all the time. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of math that can be done with an indicator column that just simply can't be done with categorical data, at least not easily. You know, I can average them, I can sum them, I can compute products. Um, so, uh, 
if, if you need to do those types of things, an indicator column is, is what's going to allow you to do that. And then, of course, all the applications pertaining to DOE that use indicator columns. Uh, with JSL, JSL is really fast in how it implements matrices. And so there's times that you can just do a really big problem in JSL that would be hard to do otherwise in a feasible amount of time just by converting to a, a matrix of indicators and processing that way. And finally, and, and we'll see an example of this, you can combine indicators into a single number that gives you an extraordinary amount of information in one, in one number, uh, essentially combining all the information of all those indicators. And um, this can be a real space savings or if you're not in it for the space, it's also an easy way to perform hierarchical binning, which we'll talk about. So, um, you know, let's go, go ahead and get into this and start working with some of these. So first of all, I wanna show you the difference between a column that has, and let's take a look here. There's two things I've got turned on here. Okay, this, this um, I've got the multiple response column property turned on, and I'm gonna actually go ahead and turn on the uh, multiple response data type as well. And the reason I'm doing both of those is you want both of these things set because different platforms consume multiple response data different ways. So they're either focused on the modeling type or they're focused on the uh, modeling property. You just wanna have them both set to make sure that whatever you're working with, it works. So let's compare the column with those properties set to one where it's not set. And let's describe the data. This was data where people are invited to share. And so they could, as in this particular row, say that they didn't read newspapers, so there's nothing there. Or they could list up to three newspapers. And so, you know, as I'm analyzing this data, uh, which is the way you'd prefer to analyze it? You know, on the left here, breaks down, it looks like there were up to six newspapers reported in total, and it breaks down the share of people responding to each one of those. And then on the right side, we got a mess. And the reason is, it's, it's, content, it's looking at each string here is just a text string. And if I, if I ever see that matched again, okay, I increase the bin count, and if, if not, I don't. And, and so any unique permutation I've got comes up as its own bin. Not even combination, permutation, like the order actually matters. So here I've got Washington Post and Wall Street Journal. Um, it, later on, you might see Wall Street Journal and Washington Post, that's counted separately. So we'll deal with that problem later, but uh, the point is, you know, this is generally how you're gonna wanna analyze the data here on the, on the left, and the multiple response column is consumed by the distribution platform to do that. So that's one nice thing. Now, another thing here is um, the, the real power, I think, that the, that the data filters have. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a global data filter so I can see it in action. Okay, and I'm going to grab this data filter and, and watch the power you have when you're dealing with multiple response data. I'm going to pick this guy right here. And let's just select carry news. See this little grayed out guy here, this any? Oh, I can't get my... My, uh, it's right below the red triangle. I can't get my, uh, I don't seem to be able to get my, my little, there he is, right here. Look right there. Okay. Let's watch what happens as I change this. Watch the power I've got. Okay, the first thing is match none. So this is saying, I, I wanna see people who did not read carry news. Okay, that everything's highlighted that did not read carry news. I could say, let's uh, let's go to, Matching any, we saw that. That's if, if carry news shows up anywhere in that line, then you're gonna highlight it. Let's go to match all and let's get another selection here. Okay, we got carry news and Durham Herald. Now notice on line 114, I also have Washington Post. That's fine. As long as I have carry news and the Durham Herald, as long as I have all of the selections I've made here, it's okay. Let's switch to exactly. Okay, now what's happened is we take a look uh, at, at all of the selection matches I get. It's got those two papers and those two papers only. It's, it's exactly the selection I make and nothing else. And that's different from match only 
because look who else got selected when I pick only. Then if I just have Durham Herald or if I just have Kerry News, that's okay. I can have them both or either one. Okay, that's the, that's the only selection. I can match at least, let's say I've got three, uh, four selections here and I can say, you know what, I wanna see anyone There are most so many of those papers or in between, you know, two and three times, uh, two and three of these papers. So the, the flexibility that the multiple response gives you is, is staggering. Okay. Now let's, um, let's proceed here to, to, to getting into, okay. Okay. You sold me, you know, how do I process this? How can I make, indicator columns and go back and forth with multiple response. So we'll start with the simplest case. Now remember, I've got these, these uh, properties set. I've got my um, multiple response column property set and the data type set. Very easy, I go to that columns utility menu and I just say I wanna make indicator columns. Now notice this does not give me a choice of delimiter. And I could include missing, that's the people that didn't read newspapers, I won't here. Boom, there it is. And you can see I've got indicator columns. You know, a one indicates the person responded to that newspaper and a zero indicates otherwise, okay? Now, let's, let's go back and say, well, maybe these column properties aren't set right now. That's okay, we can get around that by going to text to columns. With the added bonus, we get to pick our delimiter. These are common to delimited, but if they had been some other delimiter, I could type that here click make indicator columns. If I want to include missing, I can, and boom, there they are. So, two quick ways to make indicator columns. Now, what if we wanna go in reverse? Why might we want to do that? Here's a great example of why we might wanna do that. Back to this trucks data that we've seen before, uh, if you've seen some of the earlier shows, there were 35 columns of system flags for each of these trucks where I could flag anything that was wrong. But you know what, as I was looking through this data, it turned up that in fact, some trucks don't have any flags set and the rest only had one. So I'm thinking, why do you really need 35 column? I mean, I'm gonna, I, I might use those for other things, but I would just like to, to get across the point to someone, hey, what was the purpose of this report? That's so easy to do. I can just come select all 35 columns and say, you know what, let's um, go combine columns. Let's combine them and say, that's what this checkbox is for. They were indicator columns. And this is actually gonna be irrelevant, okay? The multiple response or not. I mean, typically you would select that, but remember we only have at most one of those flags set. And, and I'll just call this reason. And watch what happens. We get a nice, easy to read, easy to understand description of, of what was wrong with that vehicle. And, and I don't have to look now and scan over 35 different columns. I can just immediately see, okay, here's, here's what's going on with these vehicles. So it's nice to be able to go back and forth like that. Here's another example where um, I've got orders and we, along with each order, there may be different options that people want to to exercise. Now, if I just turn this into a uh, indicator columns right now, watch what happens. This may be what you want, uh, but let's take a look. So we go to column utilities. Again, I've got my properties set, so I can just make these indicator columns. And notice what happens. Okay, let's just take this first order. I got A's, I got B's, I got D's. And so maybe that's all we want. We just want to know, hey, what, what was it that was ordered, you know, don't tell me how many there were, just did they order any of these options? I just wanna see what, which options get ordered, you know, on a, on a particular order. The nice thing about that is you could distill it. You know, maybe you just wanna distill this information down. Well, now watch what happens when I combine these columns then. It gets simpler, almost like, almost like summarizing, if you will. Oops, I didn't, okay, well, this is a great talking point. What did I forget to do? Why did I get ones and zeros? I didn't say that I had indicator columns. So it just took the information in there, the ones and zeros. So 
So we will go combine our columns. This time I will check my box. And there we go. And so you'll notice that I don't list, you know, when, when someone ordered more than one iteration of an op, or iteration, more than one instance of an option, I, it just shows up once. Okay, so that's pretty nice. That's the easy way to do that. Um, what happens now, it, let's talk about actually wanting to count. And, and this is where it gets a little more interesting. So I'm gonna delete this column I just made and just look at these indicators and you know, maybe I, what I actually wanna see here is a two, Ray. I wanna know that this person ordered two and um, I wanna see a two for D. And likewise on, on row two, I wanna see a two for C's. How do I do that? And the, the bad news is there's not a you know, one click way to do that. The good news is we can certainly get around that. And uh, here's the way I like to do that. First of all, let's just split these guys text to columns. Okay, so we'll just come into the columns, next to columns, we've got a comma delimiter, hit okay. And now we don't need that column anymore. Now, we are going to stack the data set. So we're gonna stack all these columns up. So we'll go to tables, stack. Now, why do we do this? Well, let's get rid of all the spaces here. We don't need those. Now look what happens. This is great, this is perfect now because if I create an indicator column now, at this point with the stack data, now look what happens. Okay, these are all in order one. Let's just look at order one. Okay, when I go to my A's, there's two of them. When I go to my D's, there's two of those, there's a B. And so we've got the perfect platform for dealing with this because we have a grouping column here natively from that stack operation. Let's just summarize it. Let's just use a summary platform. And we'll say, hey, let's take the sum of all these guys. Sum, and we'll group by order ID. And I'll just change this to column name. Okay. That's exactly what we wanted. Okay, look now for this first order, we got two A's, one B, two D's. Okay, so that's the, that's the way you can go ahead and get counts. Now this kind of begs the question, you know, we, we, we stack the data, right? And um, let me see if I have, yeah, we, at some point we stacked our data to look like this. And so that, that gives the natural question, well, okay, I've got stacked data, how do I go back? How do I get that into modal response? And that's, that's a little bit trickier. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that, but the bottom line is you're not gonna be able to split out this data which is what you need to do, unless we have a, another column. Now we could do one of two things. We could go one, two, and then as we've seen before, we could continue that sequence to the end of the table and to just use this as the split by. Watch what happens here if I do that. It's okay for this table. So if I say I wanna split, I'm going to split my options, split by column three and group by order ID. Notice how many columns that made. Okay, it made 52 columns. Why? Because the original data set had 51 columns. And I, I counted, or excuse me, not 51 columns, 51 rows. And remember, I started that numbering system, one, two, three, four, and went all the way down to 51. Plus I have this order ID column. So that's why 52 columns. Not a big deal here. It would be a pretty big deal if I had a wider data set. I could just highlight all these 51 columns though and do a, a um, combine. Okay, we could do that. Instead, what I'm gonna do is make this a little bit neater. Let's go back to our example. And instead of that, we'll use a trick we used in another show. We use the column cumulative sum again. Because when I have the column cumulative sum, I can say, let's, let's sum up a bunch of ones. And remember how we grouped by that grouping variable? Now look what happens, I get for the first order, one, two, three, four, five, then the second order, one, two, and so forth. This means that my table is only gonna be as wide as it needs to be to accommodate all of the option sets. So now when I split, it's a, it's a neater result. So we'll still group by the order ID and, and um, split by that column three, 
but it's a much simpler table and you can actually see what I'm doing now when I say, look, I'm gonna take these five columns and let's combine them. Let's combine those columns. We'll make them, they are not indicator columns, so we'll just call this set. Uh, we will let them be multiple response, that's what we want, and there we go. So that's how we produced uh, the sets we had earlier in the, in the split table. So from stack to split. Also, for those of you that have, have seen that add-in, uh, the data table tools add-in that we talked about in one of the other shows, uh, if you search for data table tools add-in, th there is something I have in here because this comes up enough that you can, uh, let me see, reshape tables, convert between multiple response and stacked. So that, that actually um, will make that a little bit easier for you. But as you can see, it's not too bad. All right, so pretty good so far. Uh, let's, let's see what else could happen to us. And this, this is one of my favorite things for indicator columns in certain categories. Remember, let's say that these are now failure modes. Okay, I've got failure modes. I know it's, it's listed as option set, but let's consider that these are different ways of failing uh, from you know, tests I'm doing on a product. And what I'd like to do, I don't wanna count, for example, EA. Okay, I failed for those two reasons. Well, is that different? I think I have an AE in here somewhere. Yeah, right here. Uh, is that really different? I mean, I, I don't think it's, it depends on your data, right? It depends on how you collect it. You might say it's different because you could have primary comma secondary or something like that. Then it is different. The order matters. You don't want to mess with that. But if the order doesn't matter, this is a horrible cleanup task, uh, except for one thing. Except for when we, when we create indicator columns, check this out. When I, when I make indicator columns out of this, those are alphabetized. So when I combine the data back together, it's alphabetized. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do that. I make my indicator columns, I go straight back and combine them up and just call this um, alpha for alphabetized. Check my box here because these were indicator columns. And now look. Now it comes back, it's all alphabetized. So if I sort on this, it'll, it'll let, it, let us uh, see something easily. Let's look right here, ABD. Okay, notice that those, those showed up in three different forms in the original, ta in the original data, but we all, now we've got it consolidated. So that's another uh, great way to you know, flip back and forth there. All right. Um, I apologize, but I did not set my timer. So Julian, I'm going to ask for a quick time check. How are we doing? Uh, I think you have a minute or so. Oh, wow. Okay. A uh, minute. Well, let's try. Um, one last thing uh, that is as powerful is this idea of hierarchical binning. So let's just say I've got these, these are my failure rates again, and I want to make indicator columns from these. Now with these ones and zeros, you can combine them back, okay? But don't check the box now and don't use a delimiter. Okay, look what happens. Just give it SS name. Now these are numbers. If I convert these to a numbers, it immediately encapsulates everything that I had there. I can see here I've got you know, a flag on the first element and nothing else. Here I've got a flag on the element one, two, and four. Why this is nice is if I want to prioritize or binning and say, yes, you know, some of these are more important than others, then I put them in the order I want. And then when I get the flag, I just look at the most significant bit. And that was the biggest failure that occurred. And so, um, you know, you can save even more by researching, I don't have time to show it here, but research the hex to number with a base two, and it'll convert these all to, to their decimal equivalents of binary, and, and so you're saving even more space that way. So even, you know, even if you had 20 flags, you could still do this. So um, take a look at that. I'm sorry I've run out of time and can't uh, get into that in detail. Thanks a lot, Julian. Back to you. Thanks so much, Brady. It's always so great to see what you come up with. And uh, yeah, I hope our, our uh, viewers will go and look up that, that hex to binary because it is pretty neat. Uh, make sure you follow us on the community, community.jump.com slash jump on air. You can actually interact with all of our segment 
uh, speakers and certainly ask more questions uh, because I know they'd love to, to take you through more things that they showed. Uh, after the show, make sure you also check out discoverysummit.jump if you have a discovery paper you'd like to share. The deadline is today at 5. All we need is an abstract and a title. So you can definitely submit your abstract and title and get it in today before 5. Also, make sure you register for our Statistically Speaking seminar next Wednesday, Data Visualization for Scientists and engineer, Engineers. It's going to be a really great, great uh, stat speaking event. Make sure you remember also that we have shows Monday and Wednesday of next week. Our special sports analytics shows on Monday and science show is on Friday. We won't be here on Wednesday. We'll all be tuning in to Stat Speaking, and we think you should as well. Do share us with your colleagues. Jump.com slash JOA is the link to use. We hope you'll join us Monday. But until then, we hope you stay safe. We hope you stay healthy. We hope you're staying close even as you're keeping your distance. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs>